Okay, let's get started. Here is how the French defense starts. After white plays e2 to e4, and if black plays e7 to e6, that is called the French defense. So you made your choice, your opponent is already in it. Now we'll first start looking at various other moves than white playing d2, d4, which is by far the most common, most popular response on move 2 for white. The first game I'm going to share with you is a game of my own that I played in the European Girls' Championship back in 1981. And that's how the game continued. d3 and d5 and knight d2, knight f6, knight g2 f3. And here black has several ways to play. Black can play c5, but I chose to play knight to c6, and actually that's the line I do recommend to play as black. And here white typically would play g3 to de develop the bishop, to g2 to fianchetto, and uh, transpose to a king's Indian attack type of position. And here there is an interesting concept that uh, I like for black and recommend, taking on e4, and when the white pawn takes back, kind of making an exception from the rules and moving this e pawn a second time to e5. Generally, that's not a good thing to do in the opening because the rule of thumb is do not move the same piece twice until you're fully developed. The reason why in this case black can do this is because white has played already g2 to g3 and therefore is most likely to develop the bishop to g2, and white will have a blocked pawn on e4. And basically, by black playing e5, the bishop on g2 will be not so good, because it will be biting in a wall of his own pawn on e4. So basically that's what uh, the whole point for black is, to block this pawn, make sure it will not move forward to e5. Of course the other idea of the e6, e5 move is to open up the diagonal of this bishop for the future. So my opponent played actually bishop to g2, and I continued with bishop to c5. My opponent castled. And so did I. And here my opponent played queen e2. While I played queen e7. Both sides are preparing to occupy the only open file, the d file, with our rooks on d1 and d8, respectively. And here white played c3, which is a very typical move in such positions. In fact, even the move earlier, instead of the queen move, that's the most standard move for white to play. The idea of white's last move, c3, is to guard the d4 square, so black cannot play knight d4, and also, in some cases, to play b2, b4. And that explains black's next move, which is a5. Remember this idea in this pawn structure, in this type of positions, this is almost an automatic. The minute white plays c2, c3, black's answer is a7, a5. So this is what I mean, that it's very important to understand these ideas, these motives, these uh, typical moves that kind of go hand in hand. c3, black plays a5. I think my opponent uh, was afraid that I may play a4 and then a3, which I'm not sure how quick I would do, but in any rate, she played a2, a4, preventing that idea. And now again, a move that's typical for this pawn structure, b7 to b6, with the purpose to develop the bishop to a6. Now, especially that white's queen is on e2, that's a definitely logical and good idea. Game knight c4, and bishop a6, spinning the knight. From the opening's perspective, I think black can be quite satisfied. Black is fully developed, uh, has no weaknesses. 
black has at least equalized, if not more, at this point. I just run by quickly the rest of the game so you get a feel for the middle game part of this variation. Continued b3, b5. This is another typical idea, especially after b3 was made. White pretty much have to trade. Bishop takes back. And the reason why I was saying that especially because b3 is played is that on b3 it's much harder to protect the pawn than it was on b2. While the pawn was on b2, the queen, the bishop, the knight were solidly protecting that pawn. On b3 it's a whole lot harder, a whole lot more effort to bring defense for white. And since the b-file is open from black's perspective, black could play moves like rook b8 to attack that pawn if chooses to. My opponent played knight f to d2, trying to get the queen out of the pin, because if the queen would have moved immediately, I could take on c4 and force white to make double pawns. So white's idea is to connect the two knights, and then after having the option to move the queen out of the pin. Of course, then the rook will still remain in the pin also, that would need to be moved until the knight is free. And now I played knight to d7 with ideas of playing knight to b6, perhaps. And my opponent moved his queen out of the pin, queen d1. And I followed with rook f to d8. Definitely that rook and not the other one. The rook on a8 is busy protecting the pawn on a5 and also wants to keep the option maybe to go to the other open file to b8. And my opponent played rook e1, desperately trying to rescue the knight from that pin on c4. However, the drawback of it is that it leaves white's weakest point, the f2 square, the f2 pawn, uh, less protected. Now it's only protected by white's king on g1, and that is what I went after right away by playing queen f6, attacking the pawn. And finally, this knight is free to move from c4, move to e3, blocking the bishop's attack to f2. And now the knight is actually quite well positioned, has a potential to go to d5, which looks quite nice for white, of course, only after protecting the f2 square. I decided to trade my bishop for the knight. And white's rook took back, of course. And knight to c5. So now I'm aiming at the d3 square, which is uh, quite weak in white's position. I have three-fold attack on that square, and if the knight would get there, that would be quite nice. And that explains white's next move. That is bishop to f1. And I took, exchanged the bishops, and she took back with the queen. As you can see now, white is guarding the d3 square, so I cannot just jump in there. And played queen e6, attacking the pawn on b3 a second time. And white, instead of protecting it with a rook, which may be the more solid way, played queen b5 not only protecting the pawn, but also attacking my knight on c5 right away. I retreated my knight to d7. And finally, white got to develop the bishop to a3. And knight f6. So now the situation changed considerably, since white no longer has a bishop on g2, White's king's position is a little vulnerable. We can already think of ideas of playing queen h3, knight g4 sometime in the near future. In the meantime, my last move, knight to f6, is a discovered attack to white's knight on d2 by the rook on d8. So white needs to worry about protecting that knight, which she did by playing rook e2. Now, this is one of those situations when one side's queen is far away 
from the king's side or the side where the king is, it can be very troublesome. And that's what we'll see how black succeeded in developing a quick attack and the game was over in less than a dozen moves. I played rook a to b8 and I think white's next move is definitely a mistake. Placing the queen out of play on a4 and I continued with h5 bringing an other piece even though it's just a little pawn to the attack on the king's side. Came king g2, I guess preventing a potential queen h3 in the future. And came h4, a very typical maneuver, a temporary pawn sacrifice, but naturally to take looks really, really bad for white opening the g file against the king. I could give a check immediately, for example. So typically in such situations, white does not take the pawn, rather allows it to trade or to push. In this game, white played f3. And I continued with rook d3, attacking the pawn on c3. My opponent protected it. And then I just doubled my rooks on the d file, again, with a tempo attacking white's knight on d2 and the knight moved back to f1. Then I traded pawns and played knight to h5. Came okay, bishop to c5 and queen g6 with a sneaky threat of playing knight f4 and forking. That's why white went out of the pin by playing king f2 and I followed by playing rook d1, offering to trade rooks. And my opponent played rook e1, protecting the rook on c1. And that allowed me a nice way to end the game. Played rook 8 to d2 check, sacrificing my rook. My opponent took. And then came queen g3 check, not taking the knight. King e2, queen takes, e1 check, king d3, and rook takes d2. And white resigned as the checkmate comes on the following move. Here is a little summary of this first game that we saw. So if white after e4, e6, the French defense, plays d3, which is a very solid, unambitious way to play, and trying to play a king's Indian attack type of position, what I recommend to do, play d5, pretty much after almost any second move of white, d5 is a good idea. And after knight d2, knight f6, knight f3, knight c6. So that's the first four moves. And now comes the unusual idea that when white plays g3, getting ready to play bishop to g2, then do the trade on e4. Of course, it's even worse for white to take now with the knight because then black would trade, trade, and trade queens, stripping white from the right to castle. So naturally, white, that's why almost always would take back with the pawn, not with the knight. And then comes the unusual idea, either right away or, as I did, first bishop c5, actually with a sneaky threat of knight g4. If white doesn't hurry up and play bishop g2, that would be dangerous. And then e5, making sure white doesn't play e5 first. In the game, white's mistake was one of them that stepped into that pin with the queen later on on e2 and allowed his knight to be pinned on c4. And of course, there were some other mistakes later, keeping the queen on the queen's side, far away from the king, and uh, gave me time to develop an attack on the king's side against the king. White has a number of other moves played, especially on club level, uh, quite frequently. 
that are not particularly dangerous, but I just want to mention them. As I said, the main movies, D2 to D4, occupy the center, and that's clearly the best move for white. There are other moves, for example, like C2, C4, where black would answer D5. No problem, the pawn is protected enough times. There's not much to know about it. You just use common sense, develop your pieces, castle. It does not have theory that you'd need to know about it. There's another move that used to be favored by first world champion Steinitz, E5. I personally don't like that move, although it's not as bad as it looks. You can just play D6 or D5, but I prefer D6 and have a decent game. I remember when I was starting playing the French, a lot of my opponents used to play F4, looks ambitious. Not particularly good though, because it weakens this diagonal again as usual. The answer is D5, and after E5 you can play C5, getting pretty good control of the center. Another move I, I was facing a number of times, knight to f3. Again, you know the answer, d5. Here there is an interesting line with e5, and after c5, some people like to play a gambit, the French gambit, by playing b4. Again, I don't believe in its power. You can just take and after a3, play knight c6. And I, I don't think white has sufficient compensation, really. Although some people like the gambit and uh, just like the fact they give up a pawn. Uh, but you have nothing to worry about it from black's, black's perspective. Another move is to play b3, which uh, even in the latest Olympiad that I participated in, one of my opponents played against me. But then, again, you just play d5, and white can play bishop b2, black takes the pawn, white plays knight to c3. And I think white's hope is that black would try to protect the pawn by f5, and then they play perhaps f3 and get active play, good development. It's better for black to protect the pawn by developing the knight and rather giving the pawn up soon. After queen e2, bishop b4, which still protects the pawn indirectly, because after knight e4, knight e4, and the queen cannot take the knight back because of the checkmate coming with queen d2. So here white would castle to the queen's side and solve the checkmate problem on d2. And that's when black no longer can or should protect the pawn on e4. Queen e7, knight takes e4, and now bishop a3. It's a tricky idea that after now knight takes f6, actually the black queen can take back, as it was demonstrated by Paul Karras against Tartakov still back in 1937, because White's White cannot take on a3 because of the checkmate coming on a1. So white must play something like d4. Then black can just trade bishops and castle and have an equal position. Let's go back again to the second move after our starting moves e4 and e6. One last move that I would like to talk about is queen e2, which was the favorite of the great Russian master Chigorin 
back still in the 19th century. It's a tricky move and its idea is to kind of prevent d5. Well, it doesn't really prevent it, but it prevents black from taking back with his pawn after white would take on d5 and black would only take back with the queen. And that would be definitely welcome by white because white could play knight c3, gain a tempo attacking black's queen. And if it, for example, returns, then white could play g3. And I could certainly understand why white likes that. So queen e2 is one of the very few exceptions when I would say do not play d5 on move 2 as black, but you can play c5, for example. And then traditionally the game would transpose to a king's Indian attack type of position. White would play knight f3 and black would play knight c6 and uh, white would play these type of moves and uh, black would end up making, for example, such moves. Again, queen e2 is an extremely rare continuation, but I want you to be aware of its existence and its ideas. Welcome to the Master of French DVD. The French defense has a very special meaning to me, because as a four years old, that was the first opening I've ever learned. How to play against White's king pawn start, e2, e4. It brought to me many very pleasant memories, many won games, and exciting battles. On this DVD, I'd like to share with you my experiences. The French is a very complex, complicated opening. However, on the bright side, it has not that many forceful and long variations as, let's say, the Sicilian or other openings. It is mostly based on understanding of the strategies of the pawn structures, of plans, and of course, knowing the tactical motives of the opening. Here are some of the famous names who have used the French defense as black year after year successfully. Viktor Korchnoi, Wolfgang Ullmann, Lev Psahis, Boris Gulko, Nigel Short, Alexander Morozevich, and there are many, many more. Hopefully, after watching this DVD, you'll follow them.